cannot serve both God and wealth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Once upon a time, I had a roommate who was very much a minimalist. He tried to not have very many possessions at all, which uh, is nice when you can room with other people and they have plates and glasses and other kitchen items. You don't need any of that stuff because you can be a minimalist. You have a bunch of roommates. And as I got to know him a little better, I learned that his parents had been the types of people that had a lot of stuff and a lot of clutter around the house. Not like a hoarder situation, but like not neat and minimalist and clean. It was kind of a lot. And my roommate told me that he had read studies that people who have a lot of clutter like that are naturally a little more stressed out. Maybe not naturally, but it's like all the stuff kind of increases your stress level because there's just stuff everywhere. And so my roommate was like, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to try to have as little as possible. Well, one night he comes back and he's in a really bad mood. And I said, what's going on? And he had gotten engaged like a month before. And he and his fiance had gone out to register for gifts. And if you, you haven't done that in a while, now you go to one of the stores and they give you a little gun thing so you can scan the items that you want to register for. And she, being sort of a healthy, normal adult, was like, oh, we need eight of these glasses, eight of these glasses, eight of these. We want to host parties. We need. And he starts freaking out. Why do we need so many glasses? And they got into this huge fight and he came back. And of course, being a good roommate, I started poking him a little. I was like, oh man, you're gonna have all this stuff. He's like, I know. I said, from now on, when you move, you can't just put it in your car, you have to hire movers. He's like, I gotta hire movers? And he was getting more and more upset, uh, which was entertaining to me, but maybe made me a bad roommate. <laughs> but eventually, he's now happily married, has been for 20 years, and is, you know, has come to grips with having possessions and things. He processed that. But sometimes you push against what you were raised with, right? You kind of push against what, what you didn't like. So I'm sure some of you have known people who their parents were total neat freaks. Everything was clean. Everything was scrubbed. Everything was, and then one of their kids inevitably is the opposite. I don't mind if it's messy. I don't mind all that because they're just like, I don't want to stress so much about making sure everything's clean. And then inevitably that person has some kids and one of them becomes a neat freak because they're pushing back against what they were raised with. But how do you have freedom in life? How, how do you live a healthy life where you're not having to push back against some things, right? How do you live in like a healthy, whole kind of way? If my, my roommate was one side of the pendulum where he just wanted to be a total minimalist and not have anything, well, think about the other side of the pendulum. Think about if you suddenly came into wealth, like a couple months ago, the lottery was over a billion dollars, say you win, to say, oh, now I'm going to buy everything I've ever possibly wanted. Well, that's not healthy either, right? That's, that's, you would buy all this stuff, you would have it all around, you might get stressed, and you'd realize, oh, all these things don't actually make me happy and better off. And sometimes, I don't know about you, Sometimes I want to buy things that aren't good for me. <laughs> so it's good to not be able to buy everything you've ever wanted. But we have, you know, these pendulums where you're trying to swing one way or the other. And sometimes, like, I just want to be healthy and live in the middle as a normal, healthy, functioning adult in America. In today's gospel reading, we have this strange story of Jesus talking about a master who's very wealthy and a manager who's squandering the goods. And at the end, Jesus seems to be praising the manager for being deceitful or strange. It just has a strange story. But if you look at it closely, it's all about how is, are they dispersing possessions? How are they taking care of the wealth and how are they dispersing the things that they own? And this manager has done a bad job and is allowing it, the possessions to be squandered. So either he's not being vigilant enough 
and taking care. And so people are able to kind of, you know, take a little bit off the top here, take a little bit off the top there. And all of a sudden the wealthy man is seeing uh, people kind of stealing from him. So I see it more as the master, which in the Gospel of Luke, the Greek word that Jesus uses for master here, it's also the word that Luke uses to talk about Jesus. So you can kind of see an analogy here of Jesus playing the role of master and saying, hey, give an account of yourself. And I see it more as Jesus trying to convince us, stay vigilant. With your possessions. Stay vigilant with these things that you own. Don't just be like this lazy manager who's allowing the world and things to just kind of come and, and just be swayed here and there. But to stay vigilant. And I take this very seriously because one of my kind of classic rants as like a priest is uh, the advertising industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry that's trying to work its way into your psyche and tweak all your desires and needs to convince you to buy things you don't need, to convince you that you're not good enough until you buy this, till you buy that, till you buy this. And it's kind of always working on our brains. Like you can't really escape it by just functioning and existing in modern America. And so I, I uh, appreciate this. Jesus saying, stay vigilant, be on guard, stay awake, because there are things working on you that are going to try and draw your possessions away from you. Now, there's another, and, and then of course today's passage finishes, you cannot serve both God and money. But there's, there's one way to serve money where you're just constantly wanting it so that you can just spend it like crazy. I'm going to be this profligate spender. I'm going to spend, spend, spend. And isn't that great? And you're kind of a slave to your money in that instance. And I don't think that's healthy. Just as a random aside, I recently read that uh, Jeff Bezos bought a house in Beverly Hills for $175 million, which is kind of shocking and crazy. But then the thing said that as a percentage of his wealth, that would be like someone who makes $60,000 a year spending $66. So think about that. For Jeff Bezos to spend $175 million is like a middle class person spending $66. This is an insane level of wealth where if you think he could buy a $100 million home every week and at the end of the year I'd spend $5.2 billion dollars. And he still has an extra $180 billion. And he owns 52 homes worth $100 million. That's why I think being a billionaire would just be so horrible for any of us. I just think it would work on your psyche and you would not be grounded, healthy, whole. Uh, it would just be so problematic. But anyway, that's my aside for the pendulum on this side. But I've also... Uh, heard a story recently. There's this great podcast for couples talking about money. I recently got married, so we're learning about combining finances and money. And it has a terrible title called I Will Teach You to Be Rich. But really what it is is these couples are having problems and they use money as like the, the catalyst for having this conversation. But really the problem is the one partner doesn't listen to or respect the other partner. Or that partner is constantly just criticizing the other partner, but it comes out in the area of money. But one of the stories they tell is this couple was going to go to New York for a vacation weekend, excited to see a Broadway show, and the husband had booked a hotel for three nights. And the wife said, oh, no, no, that's too expensive. We only need that location hotel for the last night when we see the Broadway show. I'm going to get us a cheaper hotel for the first two nights. And she went through all this work to cancel the reservation, do research, find a different hotel, move in, and stay at that hotel for the first two nights. And the host of the show, he said, well, how much money did you save? She said, oh, we saved at least $200. And he said, all right, so on your vacation to save $200, you're going to go to one hotel. Then on the middle day of your trip, you're going to have to pack everything up, then figure it, check out at 11 a.m., figure out a place to go and use your luggage and hide it or store it or something so that you can check into a new hotel at 3 p.m. because you wanted to save $200. She said, yeah. 
And he said, and so what's your net worth? And this family was very miserly, saved like crazy. And she said, $5 million. And the host said, okay, this is not a good way to spend your time, your energy, or your money. He said, if you're worth, you know, $30,000, yes, maybe save the two hundred. dollars But he said, no, you have abundance. Why are you a slave to this scarcity mindset? And there's a way in which saving, 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 scrimping, saving, when you don't have to, that's this side of that pendulum that's kind of saying, well, you're still a servant of money, and you're not a servant of God. Now, this is, I'm, I'm saying we should all be responsible, pay our bills. If you need to be frugal, be frugal, all of that. But there's also a way in which frugality and penny pitching means you're still a servant to money. And so how do you pursue this healthy way of living that's in between these spectrums, these extremes, right? Well, as a Christian, hopefully our goal is to love God, love our neighbor, and love ourselves. And so I would say number one is to tithe, to give a portion of your income, ideally to the church, not just because we need the money to keep all the bills paid and to keep the church functioning, but also as a spiritual practice. It's a way of you saying, all of these possessions, this wealth, these things that I have are a gift from God. And I want to be vigilant about how I disperse possessions. And so some would say, the very first thing you do when you get your paycheck is to cut a check to the church or cut a check to whatever nonprofit you want to donate to. And it's a spiritual practice. I mean, again, the church needs the money. Please do that. But also for your own soul, as a way of staying vigilant, let me give a portion of my money back to God, back to participate in what God is doing here at St. Augustine's and here in Oakland. It's a way of, all right, I've got to stay vigilant. In some months, that donation might hurt a little bit. In some months, it might be like, great, I have abundance. Here you go, church. But it's this beautiful spiritual practice. I heard a preacher once say that it feels like in America, the goal is to have enough money so that you don't actually need faith in God. And how do we exist in this healthy medium as like a healthy, God-fearing person that loves God, loves our neighbor, and loves ourselves? How can we use our possessions and our wealth to fulfill that goal. And just as a quick aside, that final part, love yourself, for some of us, for whatever reason, that can be hard. And so maybe you look at your possession, you say, man, I need to really work on this. So I would suggest uh, using some of that money to go to therapy. Maybe using that money to, to go on retreats. Maybe use that money to, to engage in self-care so that you're reminding yourself, I am loved by God. I need to love me. These are the ways that we can be healthy adults functioning in America today. How do we ride that middle way so that we're not pushing up against this, not pushing back against this, but we're trying to be healthy, functioning, faithful Christians here in America? going to look different for each of us, but that's why we have community to encourage one another, to love one another, and to spur each other on to good deeds. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.